6th, lawmakers say you never saw this. We start here. Congressional investigators prepare their final night of primetime testimony. This is now all moving into the hands of Merrick Garland. George Stephanopoulos is here to break down what's still to come and whether this committee has accomplished its aims. Allies were calling for a national emergency. President Biden gave them this. They sort of emphasized some of the initiatives at the federal level that are already in place. What the White House can and can't do on climate change. And they were rescued from horrific child abuse, but the Turpin children say it didn't end there. They're being told they should kill themselves, that no one would love them ever again. Why their local foster system is being accused of abandoning them when they needed it most. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Brad Milkey. The House Select Committee on January 6th has been gathering evidence since just days after the attack on the Capitol. Members have sifted through emails. They've deposed witnesses. Lest you doubt the seriousness of this investigation, some of those witnesses that refused to honor subpoenas are now facing potential jail time. Steve Bannon, a vocal right-wing ally of former President Donald Trump, defiant, entering court on the third day of his trial. They will never shut me up and never shut me down. But after several public hearings, this committee says it's now only got one night of testimony left, for now at least. And this evening, they'll invite two more witnesses live in prime time in front of the nation to describe what committee members call an attempted coup. The most critical time period of that alleged coup, they say, is 187 minutes, little over three hours, from the moment former President Trump told his supporters to march on the Capitol to the moment he told them finally to go home. In between, of course, was targeted violence, clear to everyone in the world who was watching, during which the leader of the republic, the commander-in-chief, did nothing. So, what are we going to see tonight? And more importantly, what have these hearings accomplished? We're joined now by ABC's own George Stephanopoulos. George, great to have you back. I mean, as we look back on this series of hearings so far, what has been the purpose of them in your mind? Is it to get Americans all on the same page? Has it been to lay the groundwork for criminal charges? And has it been effective in whatever that mission is? All of the above. I think it's both. I think those are the two goals of the committee. And I think you can point to, from the committee's perspective, some success right there. If you look at the standing of President Trump, even inside the Republican Party and the views of whether he should be a candidate in 2024, whether the election was stolen, whether uh, he you know, worked to interfere in the election. All those numbers have gotten worse for President Trump uh, over the course of these hearings. I was struck also by the reports from our own team on Capitol Hill that Mike Pence, when he went up to Capitol Hill uh, on on, on Wednesday, got got a standing ovation from members of the House Republican Caucus. What was the reception to Vice President Pence in there? Very positive. Uh, He he was thanked in there for his courage on January 6th. And I think people embraced his message. Now, members of the House working class are not known as profiles and courage. They've tried to have it both ways for a long time, but I still think that's significant that that has happened. Secondly, I think it's pretty clear that this committee has the goal of laying the groundwork for Merrick Garland to pursue uh, criminal charges. And I think they've made great progress on one specific count, whether or not the president worked to obstruct an official uh, function of government, Hmm. which was certifying the election. And if you add up everything they put together, whether it's pulling together uh, a lot of evidence that he was intending to declare victory no matter what happened on, on election day, that he was working to have slates of alternate false electors put in place in several states, the calls down in Georgia, and then everything that happened inside uh, the White House from basically from December 14th through January 6th, um, threatening to fire members of his Justice Department, working to bring the crowd to Washington, continuing to to push the crowd to go to the Hill, and even after he knew that they were armed. um, You add all of that up, and I think you, you you do have the groundwork for the charges, and I think what they're looking to do tonight, then, is do a laser focus, as we know, on those 187 minutes in the White House between the time the riot unfolded and the president finally called for it to end, and they're going to build the case that it was a dereliction of duty. The president simply didn't do uh, his job, which is to enforce and faithfully execute the laws of the United States. So I think on both those counts, uh, they've done a pretty effective job. And as far and you mentioned some of the, the 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 bullet points here, like the key takeaways, were there particular pieces of testimony that, in your mind, did help Americans or these lawmakers sort of reframe what this was all about? 
well, Cassidy Hutchison. I mean, there's no, yep. no spoilers. As, as a, I mean, the blockbuster of blockbuster. I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. You know, even though there's some questions about whether the president actually just yelled at his Secret Service agents or actually tried to steer the car towards the Capitol, I mean, that's almost a sideshow compared to what she was saying about the president's attitude, the attitude of those around him, his lack of concern uh, for the violence on Capitol Hill, his, his, la his continuing to pressure Mike Pence, even though when he knew Mike Pence was under threat, even the, the, the details of him throwing ketchup up against the wall of the Oval Office dining room. I think that that testimony clearly broke through mm. uh, to the American public. So what's next for like what what questions remain unanswered that you think this committee will tackle either tonight or going forward? Well, you never know what other information will come forward. I think a lot of people would like to know what was in those Secret Service text messages. They say the messages were deleted as part of a technology upgrade. They acknowledge that the agents had been instructed to preserve the messages, but most of them simply didn't do it. The committee is not happy about this. But I think, is the you know, we'll see the final report. They may have another hearing if other witnesses come forward. But this is now all moving into the hands of Merrick Garland uh, and, and whether he will move to bring criminal charges against the president and others. A judge has ordered President Donald Trump's former attorney, Rudy Giuliani, to appear before a Fulton County special grand jury in August. And keep an eye on that Fulton County prosecutor down in Georgia, clearly setting the stage for prosecutions down there, sending target letters to 16 Republican lawmakers and seeming to build a case that is focused right on Trump and that infamous phone call to the Secretary of State of Georgia. Well, and that investigation into you know, these fraudulent electors seems significant, George, because in every presidential race, you've got electors. I'm going through my high school civics knowledge here. Voters don't actually select a president, right? They select who their state's electors are going to be, hence the electoral votes. And these are real people, but in like the last hundred years, they do what voters tell them to do. And here in Georgia, you had 16 people volunteering to be on a different slate of electors, these fraudulent electors who, even though Georgia had gone blue, said, we'll vote for Donald Trump instead of Joe Biden. I'm sure people are not familiar with the names on this list, but is there a real chance that these people can now be charged criminally? No question about it. I think they're under serious threat in Georgia. I also think you're going to see that that could be part of a case that Merrick Garland builds. Unreal. All right. We will see what happens later tonight. George Stephanopoulos, thanks a lot. Take care. Next up on Start Here, the heat's turning up everywhere, including on President Biden. Should a climate disaster be declared a national disaster after the break? With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. Elizabeth Holmes found guilty on four counts of fraud, facing the possibility of decades in prison. Now, we take you inside the courtroom and behind the scenes. The Dropout, Elizabeth Holmes on Trial. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. National parks are incredibly safe places. A crime will happen. Hey, my mom. My wife had fallen in really critical condition. At that time, I thought it was just a tragic accident. There's still a lot of questions we need to ask. There were small things that didn't totally add up. This is two lives for Harold that have died now. I was shocked. Something's not right. Right now, with so much at stake, Sunday mornings, this is the place. Taking on all the tough questions, straightforward reporting, no spin, no hype, no bull. Thank you for making ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. More Americans choose ABC News, America's number one news source. As scary as these heat waves have been around the world in recent days, what's even scarier is the idea that this will almost certainly get worse. Rampant wildfires, out of control flooding, uh, horrendous hurricane impacts, um, and these are likely to occur more frequently. However, 
Climate scientists say there is a big difference still between the planet getting slightly hotter and much hotter. And they insist there are still things to be done from preventing a crisis from becoming a catastrophe, which has left activists and just concerned citizens looking to the White House, saying, you know, do something. Declaring a national emergency, moving forward, marshalling resources, I think that's terrific. Reports began circulating this week that President Biden was considering taking the bold step of declaring climate change a national emergency. Well, yesterday, Biden made a speech outlining new steps on climate, but how far is he willing to go? ABC Stephanie Ebbs covers climate change. And Stephanie, is climate change a national emergency now for the White House or not? Well, that all depends on which words you want to choose. Biden and the White House would certainly say climate change is an emergency, is an existential crisis. But it, when it comes to the terms national emergency, that triggers all sorts of legal changes, new legal authorities for the president. And they're not willing yet to say affirmatively that they will take that step beyond the fact that they are seriously considering it. One hundred million Americans are under heat alert. One hundred million Americans. Ninety communities across America set records for high temperatures just this year, including here in New England. President Biden kind of took this moment where everyone is very concerned about the heat, talking about climate change, very frustrated with inaction in Congress, and, and stepped out to say, look, we're here. As president, I have a responsibility to act with urgency and resolve when our nation faces clear and present danger. I have been talking about this for years. The administration is doing a lot. So they sort of emphasized some of the initiatives at the federal level that are already in place. They diverted a lot of new resources to programs like a, a FEMA program that helps communities become more resilient to the impacts of climate change, as well as a program that helps low-income families install more efficient air conditioners. So these are not bad things to be doing. There's po great positives for for both of those programs, both for communities and families and for climate change. More than half of the energy that we use is used to heat and cool our homes. So that is a positive step for reducing emissions. However, he didn't really come out and announce a new set of extraordinarily aggressive policies on climate change that, that a lot of experts and activists would have liked to see him do. I was going to say, I heard the but coming in there, but there's not actually a ton here. Like, mm. what, what steps could have an effect that he's looking at here? Anything? The biggest things that we are waiting on are some of the, the federal rules. We can't continue to risk everything for energy. You know, I mean, the coal keeps the lights on, they say. But at what cost? We saw the EPA versus West Virginia decision. EPA is still working out a rule to regulate emissions for power plants in the wake of that decision. So there's a lot of anticipation about how they will do that, how aggressive it could be with this new legal precedent and how that will play out. A national electric vehicle charging network with the potential to bring cost-saving technology to rural communities and help to fight the climate crisis. There's also changes coming from you know, the Department of Transportation on emissions from vehicles and trucks. They're rolling out this EV infrastructure money. All of these programs from the bipartisan infrastructure law are getting underway. So there is a lot churning at the federal level. It's just sort of in that part of government that isn't exactly this, the sexy headlines of we're going to stop using all fossil fuels. It's a bit more of a, of a slow burn in terms of, of the federal policy. Yeah, but Stephanie, climate activists would say, like, it is, sorry, you you need that huge headline because you just, not for the headline's sake, but you need to severely impact emissions right, right now. Like, we're seeing temperatures exceed expectations. So what else is out there for, if it's not the Biden White House, who else has the power to do something at this point? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, listen, all of the science tells us we need to bring down these emissions as rapidly as possible. And in an ideal world, that involves drastic changes. What we urgently need to do uh, is reduce emissions to zero so we can stop any further warming. It's both levels of action. It's stopping further warming and living with the extra heat we've already built up in the system. Not every industry, not every place is equipped to make those changes right away without impacts without support to do so. Because the federal government now is going to be, frankly, uh, much less effective in restraining pollution. 
which means more of that burden is going to be on our shoulders. There's a lot going on at the state level, at the local level, and Biden even said a lot of governors are doing really good work in this area, but they need all 50 governors on board. They need all of the support on the local level because as we've seen in the recent developments from Congress, legislative action doesn't really seem to have a path forward right now. So it's all gonna fall to executive action that the president can take on the federal level, regulations, and then state and local action. Yeah, Republican congressional members and Democrat Joe Manchin from West Virginia, perhaps standing in the president's way. Stephanie Ebbs covering climate as always. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Brad. This is 911. Do you have an emergency? Um, I just ran away from home. It was a clear night in 2018 when a 17-year-old named Jordan Turpin escaped from her parents' home. They pull our hair. They, they yank out our hair. I have two, my two little sisters right now are chained up. She ran as fast as her legs would carry her and then called 911 to tell police that for most of her life, she had been held captive and tortured by her parents and that she had 12 other siblings. I don't know how you had the courage, never having spoken to anyone like that. I think it was like us coming so close to death so many times. And like, I was worried about my siblings. And when I saw them crying and worried, I just felt like I had to do it. Like. Like, I, I would just wanted to do it. I wanted to help everyone. For many who followed this story, that's where they thought this tragedy ended. Authorities came to the home. They found the children living in squalor, some even in shackles. They arrested the parents and brought the kids to safety. Allegations of their second horror. Six of the 13 Turpin siblings filing a lawsuit now. But recently, ABC's investigative unit has been digging into shocking allegations that even after these younger siblings were rescued, their abuse was not over. In new lawsuits, they say it continued at the hands of their assigned foster family. ABC's chief investigative reporter Josh Margolin has been leading this investigation. And Josh, I almost couldn't believe it when your team broke this news. What are the allegations here? Brad, it really is just so, so hard horrifying and there was this this global coverage and this sigh of relief almost that these children were getting out and going to be put into the hands of the government where they could be taken care of and then as we've been reporting over these last months we've learned that that the Turpin children were failed by the systems that are in place the adult and child welfare systems that are in place to help people who have really special needs and don't have family and don't have resources. And then to top all of this off, this week this lawsuit is filed and it, it deals with the youngest of the Turpin children, the minors, and there is an accusation that they were physically abused and some of them even sexually abused in foster care once they were put into the care of the county and the county then put them into the foster system. This is a case that's being brought against ChildNet, which is a foster family agency, and also against the county of Riverside. The lawsuits were filed this week by two lawyers in California, Alon Zexter and Roger Booth. It, it's just shocking and horrific, and it should have never happened. There are accusations that there were repeated instances of uh, hitting in the face with sandals, allegedly, pulling of hair, statements that, that they're worthless and they should hurt themselves. They're being told they should kill themselves, that no one would love them ever again, that no one does love them. And then, as I said, you know, there is an accusation that, that one of the, the family members, the father in the family, that he allegedly sexually abused some of, of the children in the care. As horrific as their family home was, that was something that was new and different and horrible um, and is now being treated as, as a criminal uh, situation by the DA's office. And let's be clear, it's not simply a lawsuit. There are criminal charges that have already been filed in Riverside County, California. And the family uh, has pleaded not guilty. Just devastating to think about. Is there, I mean, what sort of evidence have investigators been pursuing on the allegations or on the foster parents themselves? On the evidence, the criminal charges and the lawsuits filed this week suggest that there is evidence to back up the accusations. Now, there have not been trials. But there was a report that was issued 
earlier this month. Some of the older siblings experienced periods of housing instability and food insecurity as they transitioned to independence. And this report was done by outside investigators brought in by Riverside County in the wake of our reporting. And that report confirmed that there were substantial issues similar to these in the child and adult welfare systems in Riverside County. Additionally, the county does not have enough suitable non-kin foster families to support the number of children needing placement. So even the county themselves has now acknowledged that the Turpin children and other people in their care have been failed by the system. There were a number of people inside ChildNet who raised concerns about this particular foster family. And according and to this then, lawsuit, this is not the first time the foster parents have been suspected of abuse. In fact, Riverside County and the foster care contractor they use knew that this foster family had already been labeled, quote unquote, unfit because of a history of abuse and neglect. Wait, you're saying that these are some of the most high profile victims of child abuse that these officials have ever come across. They find them, and then the lawsuit says they were then sent to a family that had been accused of abusing children already? The reason why we ultimately were able to get this information confirmed was that the district attorney in Riverside County felt that there was no other way to fix this problem than to go public and to sit down with Diane Sawyer last year. I was telling them everything. We don't go to school, we live in filth, uh, we starve and all this stuff. I had to make sure that if I left, we wouldn't go back because, and we would get the help we needed because if we went back, there's no way I would be sitting here right now. His reason for doing that and the reason why the Turpin children who spoke with Diane decided to come forward was because they wanted to make sure this type of thing would never happen to anybody again. And the logic that if this type of thing could happen to children who have had such notoriety, right. imagine what would happen to the children, the people in the system who have no public profile and, and no one's concerned or asking about them. What do the foster parents say? And what does the county say about how they handled this? The foster parents have denied any guilt. They've pleaded not guilty in criminal court. Yesterday, Riverside County's Department of Social Services sent in a statement to ABC saying they haven't received the lawsuit yet and they're going to review it and they'll determine next steps. But generally, the county can't comment on pending legal matters or specific juvenile cases because of confidentiality laws. The one thing that they stressed was, quote, our hearts go out to the Turpin siblings. Any instance when a child is harmed is heartbreaking. We continue to evaluate our practices with a critical eye and are committed to understanding and addressing the root cause. The agency that also was named in the lawsuit, ChildNet, they issued a statement yesterday again saying that they cannot comment on specifics related to a child welfare case, uh, but they do look forward to providing the facts at the appropriate time in court, and they also stressed that they have been serving vulnerable and traumatized youth for over 50 years, and they stood by their track record of providing excellent care, quote unquote, and want to continue to demonstrate their commitment to these children. Sad story with huge consequences for Riverside County, California, and the foster system there. Josh Margolin, great reporting. Thanks so much. Brad, thank you. And one last thing, you know what they say, snitches get new sales pitches. It's wicked fast and damn near impossible to see. What do I do with it? You catch it. Outside of literature, perhaps no part of the Harry Potter franchise has had a bigger impact on the real world than Quidditch. Over the years, a made-up game played by wizards on broomsticks has been transformed into an internationally known sport, with real earthbound muggles running around with sticks between their legs, throwing balls through hoops, and running after someone carrying a tennis ball known as the snitch. The to hit and the at the same time. Just a little, just even, just go. Score! 
Well, this week, Major League Quidditch, yes, that is a thing, made an announcement along with U.S. Quidditch. They're changing the name of the sport. A survey went around with possible new name ideas. Some of these options were Quick Ball, Quadra Ball, and Quid Strike. From now on, the sport of Gryffindors and Hufflepuffs will now be known as Quad Ball. Why make the change? Well, for one, Quidditch has an image problem, and her name is J.K. Rowling. Because she showed us with her Burke series and her actions that misfits have a home. And then with her actions, she took that all the way and she said, no, they don't. The Harry Potter author's comments about transgender youth has struck a nerve in the Quidditch community, which includes a lot of LGBTQ athletes, many of whom have shared stories of finding refuge in a non-traditional sport. So that's one issue. But the bigger consideration might be that the name Quidditch doesn't really belong to sports associations. It belongs to Warner Brothers. Harry Potter is called the snitch. Gryffindor. And when a movie studio owns the rights to pretty much every reference being made on the field, well, it's tough to confidently grow the sport without knowing whether you'll eventually get sued. The co-founder of the sport says he'll miss the literary roots, but that quad ball will allow the sport to continue to flourish. It's already got hundreds of teams across dozens of countries. But what will happen to all the other Hogwarts references? Quaffles and bludgers and snitches, they all have their own trademark issues. Major League Quidditch says they'll stay in place for now, but they could change faster than a Nimbus 2000. Because I've been asked, the whole team loaded up the sorting hat last night, took the quiz. Your host apparently is a Hufflepuff. Jen and Lewis, our producers, are Ravenclaws 100%. And Kelly is legit decorating her house for Halloween already. So obviously, she is house Slytherin. A hey, reminder on these January 6th hearings, they will be live tonight across ABC News platforms, abcnews.com, the ABC News app, everywhere. You can check that out starting at 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm Brad Milkey. See you tomorrow. Here we go, you ready? Let's do it.